chapter fourteen of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva father and son father and son had dined together alone and for most of the time in silence cornelius bent had brought his business mien uptown with him and courtland with a discretion borrowed of experience made only the most perfunctory attempts at a conversation since the lone tree affair there had happened a change in their relations which each of them had come to understand courtland bent's successive failures in various employments had at last convinced his father that his son was not born of the stuff of which captains of industry are made the loss of the mine had been the culminating stroke in courtland's ill fortune and since his return to new york he had been aware of a loss of caste in the old man's eyes general bent had a habit of weighing men by their business performances and their utility in the financial enterprises which were controlled from the offices of bent and company it was not his custom to make allowances for differences in temperament in his employees or even to consider their social relationships except in so far as they contributed to his own financial well-being he had accustomed himself for many years to regard the men under him as integral parts of the complicated machinery of his office each with its own duty upon the successful performance of which the whole fabric depended he had figured the coefficient of human frailty to a decimal point and was noted for the strength of his business organization to such a man an only son with incipient leanings toward literature music and the arts was something in the nature of a reproach upon the father himself court had left college with an appreciation of aeschylus and euripides and a track record of ten seconds flat so far as bent senior could see these accomplishments were his only equipment for his eventual control of the great business of the firm of which his father was the founder the greek poets were greek indeed to the general but the track record was less discouraging so courtland began the business of life at twenty-three as a runner for the bank rising in time to the dignity of a post inside a brass cage figuring discounts where for a time he was singularly contented following the routine with a cheerfulness born of desperation as assistant to the cashier he was less successful and when his father took him into his own office later and made him a seller of bonds courtland was quite sure that at last he had come into his own for the selling of bonds it seemed required only tireless legs and tireless imagination both of which he possessed only after a month he was convinced that bond sellers are born not made the general still hoping against hope had now taken him back into his office on a salary and an interest in business secured and thus made his son more or less dependent upon his own efforts for the means to enjoy his leisure father and son existed now as they had always done on a basis of mutual tolerance a hazardous relation which often threatened to lead and often did lead to open rupture to-night courtland was aware that a discussion of more than usual importance was impending and when dinner was over the general ordered the coffee served in the smoking-room the door of which after the departure of the butler he firmly closed general bent lit his cigar with some deliberation 
while cortland watched him studying the hard familiar features the aquiline nose the thin lips the deeply indented chin wondering as he had often wondered before how a father and son could be so dissimilar it was a freak of heredity nature's little joke at cornelius bent's expense the general sank into his armchair thoughtfully contemplating his legs and emitting a cloud of smoke as though seeking in the common rite of tobacco some ground of understanding between his son and himself i want to speak to you about the rays he said at last cortland's gaze found the fire and remained on it you are aware that a situation has arisen within the past few weeks which has made it impossible for bent and company or myself personally to have any further relations either financial or social with jeff ray he has taken a stand in regard to his holdings in sawatch valley which i consider neither proper nor justifiable to make short of a long matter i thought it best some weeks ago to forget the matter of the mine and make ray an offer for his entire interests in the sawatch valley it was a generous offer one that no man in his position had a right to refuse but he did refuse it in such terms that further negotiations on the subject were impossible yes sir i know put in his son ray's rise is one of those remarkable combinations of luck and ability i'll concede him that which are to be found in every community once in a decade from obscure beginnings god knows what the fellow sprang from he has worked his way up in a period of three years to a position of commanding influence he owns the biggest independent smelter in the west built it we now believe with the intention of underbidding the amalgamated he has not done so yet because he hasn't been sure enough of himself but he's rapidly acquiring a notion that nothing jeff ray can do will fail that is his weak point as it is with every beggar on horseback you are familiar with all of these facts you've had some occasion bitterly to form your own judgment of the man when you came east i was under the impression that aside from business there were other reasons why you disliked him that is correct sir muttered cortland there were the general eyed his son sharply before he spoke again am i to understand that those reasons still exist or one moment sir i'd like to know just where this conversation is drifting my relations with ray have never been pleasant he isn't the type of man i've ever cared much about no conditions that i'm aware of could ever make us friendly and aside from his personality which i don't admire i'm not likely to forget the lone tree matter very soon hm that still rankles does it it does with me <laughs> with all of us oh i'm not blaming you court if you had been a little sharper you might have made one last investigation before you signed those papers but you didn't and that's the end of that part of the matter what i want to know now is just what your relations with the ray family are at the present moment you hate ray and yet most of your leisure moments are spent in the company of his wife am i to understand wait a moment sir cortland had risen and moved uneasily to the fireplace i'd prefer that mrs ray's name be kept out of the discussion i can't see how my relations with her can have any bearing they have the general interrupted suavely if mrs ray is to receive your confidences i can't give you mine thank you 
bitterly i didn't know i had ever done anything to warrant such an attitude as this tut tut don't misunderstand me whatever your sins they've always been those of omission i don't believe you'd betray me wilfully but intimacies with the pretty women are dangerous especially intimacies with the wives of one's financial enemies unless of course there's some method in one's madness what do you mean i'm sorry i don't make my intention clear if your friendship with mrs ray can be useful to bent and company i see no reason why it shouldn't continue but if it jeopardizes my business plans in any way it's time it stopped in my office you are in a position and will i hope in the near future be in a further position to learn all the business plans of the amalgamated and other companies of course i don't know how far mrs ray enjoys the business confidences of uh, her husband but it is safe to assume that being a woman she knows much more than her husband thinks she does i don't intend that you should be placed in an embarrassing position with respect to her or with respect to me i'm on the point of starting the machinery of my office on a big financial operation for the amalgamated reduction company the exact nature of which until the present moment has remained a secret your part in this deal has been mapped out with some care and the responsibilities i have selected for you should give you a sense of my renewed faith in your capabilities but you can't carry water on both shoulders you're very flattering sir i've never carried much water on either shoulder and my relations with mrs ray hardly warrant i can't see that impatiently you're so often together that people are talking about you curtis janey has spoken to me about it of course your affair with gretchen is one that you must work out for yourselves but i'll confess i'm surprised that she stands for your rather obvious attentions to a married woman cortland bent smiled at the ash of his cigar his father saw it and lost his temper i'm tired of this shilly-shallying he snapped you seem to make a practice in life of skating along the edge of important issues i'm not going to tolerate it any longer and i've got to know just where you stand well dad calmly where shall we begin with gretchen very well gretchen and i have decided that we're not going to be married what we have no intention of marrying next year or at any other time well of all the curtis janey doesn't know this he should gretchen is in love with somebody else and i you i understand you are too you're in love with jeff ray's wife he paused but his son made no reply though the old man watched his face curiously for a sign the general knocked his cigar ash into the fire is that true under the circumstances i should prefer not to discuss the matter why you and i haven't always been in sympathy but the fact remains that i'm your father the old man's long fingers clutched the chair arm and he looked straight before him speaking slowly i suppose you've got to have your fling i did every man does but you're almost old enough to be through that period now there was never a woman in the world worth the pains and anxieties of an affair of this kind a woman who plays loose with one man will do it with another the fashion of making love to other men's wives did not exist when i was young cortland turned to the fire his lips compressed and with the tongs replaced a fallen log when i was young the old man went on a man's claim upon his wife was never questioned society managed things better in those days 
ostracism was the fate of the careless woman and men of your age who sought married women by preference were denied the houses of the young girls of their own condition if a fellow of your type had oats to sow he sowed them with a decent privacy instead of bringing his mother his sister into contact cortland straightened up the tongs in his hand his face pale with fury saying in stifled tones for god's sake stop or i'll strike you as you sit the general moved forward in his chair almost imperceptibly and the cigar slipped from his fingers and rolled on the hearth for a long moment the two men looked into each other's eyes the elder conscious that for the first time in his life he had seen his son really aroused there was no fear in the father's look only surprise and a kind of reluctant admiration for a side of cortland's character he had never seen he sank back into his chair and looked into the fire oh he muttered you had no right to speak of mrs ray in those terms said cortland his voice still quivering i'm sorry i did not know cortland set down the fire tongs his hands trembling and put both elbows on the mantel-shelf perhaps since you know so much he said in a suppressed voice i had better add that i would have married her if ray hadn't really you surprise me there was a moment of silence which proved to both men the futility of further discussion if you don't mind i'd rather we didn't speak of this mrs ray would understand your viewpoint less clearly than i do she is not familiar with vice and she does not return my feeling for her if she did i should be the last person in the world she would see i can't believe you it is the truth strange as it may seem to you and to me she loves her husband she married him for his money cortland was silent memory suddenly pictured the schoolroom at mesa city where he had won camilla and lost her in the same unfortunate hour his hour of mistakes spiritual and material a crucial hour in his life which he had met mistily a slave of the caste which had bred him a trifler in the sight of the only woman he could love just as he had been a trifler before the world in letters and in business no he replied she did not marry him for money she married him for other reasons she found those reasons sufficient then she finds them sufficient now he dropped heavily with the air of a broken man into an armchair and put a hand over his eyes as though the light hurt them don't try to influence me sir let me think this out in my own way perhaps after what you've told me about the amalgamated i ought to let you know speak to me freely court said the old man more kindly i don't want you to think of camilla as the wife of jeff ray i want you to think of her as i think of her as herself as the girl i knew when i first went west an english garden rose growing alone in the heart of the desert how she had taken root there heaven only knows but she had and bloomed more tenderly because of the weeds that surrounded her he paused a moment and glanced at his father general bent had sunk deep in his chair his shaggy brows hiding his deeply set eyes which peered like those of a seer of visions into the dying embers before him a spell seemed to have fallen over him cortland felt for the first time in his life that there was between them now some subtle bond of sympathy unknown undreamed of even encouraged he went on she was different from the others i thought then it was because of the rough setting i know now that it wasn't she is the same here that she was out there i can't see anything in any other woman i don't want to see anything in any other woman i couldn't make her out it puzzled me that i could do nothing with her 
after school hours she was the schoolmistress you know sir we rode far up into the mountains she got to be a habit with me then a fever i didn't know what was the matter except that i was sick because of the need of her i didn't think of marriage then she was nothing her father kept a store in abilene kansas i thought of you all my inherited instincts my sense of class distinction of which we people in new york make such a fetish were revolted but i loved her and i told her so cortland sat up then leaned forward his elbows on his knees and followed his father's gaze into the fire she was too clean to understand me sir i knew it almost before i had spoken in her eyes there dawned the horror the fear the self-pity which could not be said in words then jeff ray came in and i left her left mesa city there was nothing else to do his voice which had sunk to a lower key halted and then was silent a chiming clock in the hallway struck the hour other clocks in dainty echo followed in different parts of the house an automobile outside hooted derisively but for a long while the two men sat each busied with a thread of memory which the young man had unreeled from the spool of life in the midst of his thoughts court heard a voice at his elbow the voice of an old man tremulous and uncertain a softer voice than his father's it is strange very very strange what is strange sir cornelius bent passed his fingers before his eyes quickly and straightened in his chair your story it's strange you know court i too once loved a woman like that the way you do it's an old romance before your mother court nobody knows nobody in the east ever knew even carolyn he stopped speaking as though he had already said too much got up slowly and walked the length of the room while cortland watched him conscious again of the sudden unusual sense of conciliation in them both at the other end of the room the general stood a moment his hands behind his back his gaze upon the floor i am sorry court he said with sudden harshness and then after a pause you must not see mrs ray again cortland's hands clenched until the knuckles were white and his eyes closed tightly as though by a muscular effort he must rob them of a persistent vision when he spoke his voice was husky like that of a man who had been silent for a long time you're right sir i've thought so for some days but it's not so easy sometimes i think she needs me need you don't they get along i don't know there are times when i feel that i am doing the right sort of thing he doesn't abuse her i don't know she'd be the last person to speak of it if he did but i think she doesn't altogether want me to go general bent shook his head slowly no court it won't do what you've just told me makes your duty very clear your duty to her and your duty to yourself there's danger ahead danger for you both you may not care for my advice we've not always understood each other but i hope you'll believe me when i say that i offer it unselfishly with the single purpose of looking after your own welfare leave new york i'm prepared to send you west next week if you'll go there will be a lot of work for us all it's possible that i may go too before long i can give you duties which will keep you busy so that you won't have time to think of other things when i first spoke to you of this business tonight, i spoke as president of the amalgamated reduction company now i am speaking to you as a father i want you with us more than ever largely on our account but more largely now upon your own will you go cortland rose and leaned one elbow on the mantel 
you want me to help you in the fight for Ray's smelter yes i do don't you want me to see her again it's wiser not to no good can come of it perhaps a great deal of harm she would not understand she knows i dislike her husband but it seems to me i ought to tell her that you're making financial war upon her husband forewarn him forearm him what else would you say that doesn't seem fair to me does it he paused watching his son narrowly and yet with a kind of stealthy pity cortland's struggle cost him something i suppose you're right he said at last and then turning around toward his father i will not see her again give me the work sir and i'll do my best perhaps i haven't always tried to do that i will though if you give me the chance your hand on it court i won't forget this i'm glad you spoke to me it hasn't always been our custom to exchange confidences but i'll give you more of mine if you'll let me i'm getting old more and more i feel the need of younger shoulders to lean on i'm not all a business document but the habit of mercilessness grows on one downtown mercy has no place in business and it's the merciful man that goes to the wall but i have another side there's a tender cord left in me somewhere you've struck it to-night and there's a kind of sweetness in the pain of it court it's rusty and out of use but it can still sing a little cortland laid his hand on the old man's shoulder almost timidly as he might have done to a stranger you'll forgive me father oh that and he took his son's hand i honor you for that my son she was the woman you loved you could not hear her badly spoken of perhaps if i had known my duty i should have guessed say nothing more you are ready to take my instructions yes and the sooner the better very good you'll hear more of this to-morrow i am i'm a little tired to-night i will see you at the office cortland watched him pass out of the door and listened to his heavy step on the broad staircase cornelius bent was paying the toll of his merciless years when he was gone cortland sank into the big chair his father had vacated his head in his hands and remained motionless End of chapter fourteen